opportunities, whilst also advancing knowledge on effective climate governance practice. The CCLI works with more than 80 climate governance experts and affiliated research scholars across Canada and is housed at the University of British Columbia Centre for Business Law on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam peoples. So as you can imagine, narrowing the list of 26 champions was both difficult, and but also very, very rewarding. And so to assist us, the way we did it was we drew on the CCLI's experts and scholars, as well as on our own network of offices in Canada. And in short, we were looking for individuals who, through their work and career choices, have dedicated themselves to working towards combating climate change. And today we want to honour those individuals. So the way it'll work today is we'll be introducing our champions to, to you throughout the course of today's session. We have a lot to cover in an hour, so unfortunately we won't be able to hear from everybody, but we will be able to, we'll, we'll be following up with those people attending on Zoom by sending details of our nominated champions in, the, in this form of a storybook, which will also be available on our website. And each champion has provided us with a quote, and together that makes for a really compelling reading, as you can imagine. We're also going to be tweeting live and revealing details of our nominated champions as we go. And you can follow us at UK in Canada and or at Can Climate Law. And we're also delighted that two of the um, nominated champions, in addition to Minister McKenna, who's also a nominated champion, uh, two others, David Suzuki and Melina Labukan Massimo, have also agreed to speak to us today on their hopes for COP26. So during the next hour, we'll hear from the British High Commissioner, Susan lejeune Dalgazek, as well from the, Hon from the Honourable Catherine McKenna, Minister of Infrastructure and Communities, on UK and Canadian priorities for COP26, as well as some thoughts on how we can work together. And at the end of the session, we hope we'll have some time for Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. So uh, without further ado, I'd now like to invite the British High Commissioner, Susan lejeune Dalgazek, to open today's event and tell us a little bit about the UK's priorities for COP26. So over to you, High Commissioner. Thank you very much, Nicole. And uh, thank you, a uh, huge thank you to everybody who's taken part in the process to choose these champions, but also congratulations to the three champions, Minister McKenna, David Suzuki and Melina for, for joining us today. Um, I'm really interested to hear your perspectives. Um, COVID has been uh, a terrible, terrible thing for our planet and, and for our populations. But I think it's also shown us what we can do when we put our minds to it. Uh, it would have been unthinkable even 18 months ago that countries would be able to develop and administer to their populations vaccines for a new disease that nobody had heard about. And we've done it and we've done it effectively and we've done it quickly. Um, when we listen to our scientists, when we, when we look at the evidence and when we turn our minds to it and we work with the private sector and we work with, uh, with uh, citizens' organisations, we can do anything. Uh, that's the same emphasis, that's the same energy, that's the same urgency that we now need to bring to the climate crisis, which is uh, an existential crisis for our populations and our planets. The same bold, courageous policymaking, the same engagement with the private sector, the same use of our brilliant scientists, and the same public sector delivery needs to be part of our response to the, cri the climate crisis and this is the year in which the UK takes a leading role in confronting that as we host COP26 in Glasgow later this year. We're today six months from, from that conference um, and uh, there's still a lot to do but we've made a huge amount of progress already. We know that there, we've had a challenging 12 months and I think one of the dangers at the moment is that COVID has been so all-encompassing for every government is that we could lose sight of the climate crisis. Um, and, and not devote the attention that we need to in order to draw up the policies and the responses which will allow us to confront the dangers uh, successfully. For the UK, climate change is also our number one foreign policy priority. It's right at the heart of what my team in Canada is doing. And I'm delighted that many of the people who've been nominated as climate champions are people with whom we have worked closely over the last uh, years and we will continue work to work closely with you all as we work towards COP26 and I particularly would like to thank, thank Minister McKenna in her current and her previous roles for the fantastic cooperation that we've had with her. Um, so what does the UK want from COP26? What are, what are our plans? What are our, our, our emphasis? The, well the first is obviously mitigation. COP26 uh, is the first time that countries will be invited to improve on their Paris emission re reduction targets. At the time of the Paris Agreement, our pledges put the world on course for three degrees of warming, and we now know how damaging that will be. The cons consequences for our population and our planet, if we don't do better, are dire. 
We believe in leading by example, and that's why we recently announced the world's most ambitious climate change target, a 78% reduction by 2035 compared to the levels in 1990. It's going to be really hard to get there, but we're confident that we can do it. And two weeks ago, we were absolutely delighted to see a number of ambitious ambition raising announcements at the US hosted Climate Action Summit, including a fantastic announcement from the Canadian government, which we welcome as a great step forward. Um, but that's not enough. There are plenty of other countries which still need to show the same level of achievement, uh, sorry, of ambition so that we can achieve what we need to. The second uh, part of our vision for COP26 is adaptation. Even if we stopped emissions rising today, we would still need to deal with the consequences of the climate change which has already taken place. And while every country in the world is affected, uh, the most vulnerable countries and the most vulnerable populations are more impacted than the rest of us. Uh, significant disruption to the economy, extreme weather and climate related shocks are affecting the world's most vulnerable populations. They affect women more than men, they affect children, and they have knock on effects for every country around the world, not just on the climate, but in terms of migration and, 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 and uh, security issues. COVID-19 COVID has dramatically illustrated why we need to prepare for and build resilience to future shocks. And an important part of, our, of the discussions at COP will be about building resilience across the world. There are a number of processes and mechanisms we'd like to see in place which will allow us to, to improve our own adaptation but none of them come without spending. So that leads me on to the most difficult question of all, money. Uh, the third thing that we need to do for, for COP is to mobilize finance. At COP16, developed countries pro promised $100 billion a year to address the needs of developing countries. We are doubling our international climate, climate finance to $11.6 billion from now until 2025. We'd like to see every country in the world that can do so match that ambition. Uh, it is not enough to say that we care. We need to show that we care and we need to show that we care not just about our own populations, but populations across the globe. If not, inequality and the impact on the poorest and most vulnerable will continue to increase and the differences between us will go, grow deeper and deeper. And while public finance is really important, it's not enough. We need the private sector to be engaged to deliver the trillions that we need for a climate resilient future. So we are asking every financial institution to join the race to zero, publishing and implementing credible plans for a net zero transition and committing to a future for their business and their customers, which can co contributes to sustainable growth. Economic growth is not good, is, is not necessarily good. It needs to be sustainable in order to benefit the whole population. The fourth point, we need to work together to accelerate action. We're committed to hosting an, an, an inclusive COP, which brings about lasting change. That means finalizing the Paris rule book of part of a successful negotiated agreement, working with our partners to shift towards clean power and zero emission vehicles and strengthening institutions. And the UK and Canada have already shown what can be done as we work together in the Powering Past Coal Alliance, which has made significant difference to the number of countries which use coal to generate uh, electricity with catastrophic effects on the climate. And one last point on inclusion. We're committed to implementing the UNFCCC Gender Action Plan, which includes action on gender responsive finance using international climate programming to build women and girls climate resilience and supporting the UNDP's climate finance, net finance network. We want to ensure that women are engaged across all levels of climate action. Through our funded Climate Ambition Support Alliance, we're supporting the Women Negotiator Mentoring Initiative to level the playing field between women and men in international climate negotiations. In summary, this is a huge project with huge ambition, and it's also massively important. There is not a single other issue which is more important to every single government across the world today. I have every confidence that we can deliver it because we're working with amazing partners, including our partners here in Canada, uh, both in the government and in civil society. It's been a huge pleasure for me and the team across Canada to get to know many of the champions to work with the organizations they represent as we raise awareness and more importantly, take action to address climate change. I look forward to continuing to work, all, work with all of you and congratulations on all of you for your nominations. Thank you.
Thank you so much, High Commissioner. That was a um, fantastic overview of our priorities. And as you said, it, quite rightly, it is the absolute number one priority for us um, for this year and, and going forward as well. Um, so if I could ask you to uh, begin our um, announcements and introduce our first batch of eight climate champions, please. And my colleague Sonia Lee will be switching over the slides so that people can see as they come up. So um, over to you again. Thank you, Nicole. So the first, the first eight climate champions are, first of all, David Isaac, the president and CEO of WDusk Energy. The second is André Lise Mekto, the founder and managing partner at Cycle Capital Management. The third, my friend Bruce, Bruce Laurie from the Ivy Foundation. Martha Hall Findlay, an amazing woman from, from Alberta, who's the Chief Sustainability Officer at Suncor. Dan Wicklam, the President and CEO of the Transition Accelerator. Sarah Hastings Simon, Scientist and Senior Research Associate at the Payne Institute at the Colorado School of Mines, School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. Denis Leclerc, President and CEO of Ecotech Quebec. And Barbara Svan, the inaugural President and CEO at the University Pension Plan Ontario. Thank you so much, High Commissioner. As I say, that is our first batch. We have we have two more to go. And just to reiterate, um, everybody will be, who's on the Zoom call today will be receiving a copy of the storybook, which sets out much more detail, uh, people's backgrounds, bios, and we'll also pull together all the quotes, as I know that we probably haven't got enough time to, to focus on each slide for you to read them thoroughly, but it will make a great compendium afterwards. Um, so next, I'm delighted to hand over to uh, the Honourable Catherine McKenna, Minister for Infrastructure and Communities, who's going to talk to us a little bit about Canada's vision for COP26. And uh, as I said earlier, Minister McKenna is also one of our nominated champions. So uh, many congratulations on that, Minister. Uh, well, thanks very much. Uh, it's so great to see so many friends uh, who are champions. So uh, congratulations to all of you. Uh, thank you very much to the High Commissioner. I'm going to try to get your name right, Suzanne Lejeune Dargerzik, Zek, um, as well as to um, the CCLI for hosting this great event. Uh, I think it's really important that we recognize people that are really going the extra mile uh, to promote climate ambition. Um, I want to start by recognizing that I'm the, on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples. And I, I wish I could lift up my camera because you would see behind me, I, I have a piece of infrastructure. Uh, it's an Algonquin uh, canoe, uh, birch bark canoe that uh, it's 100 years old and it was used in the Ottawa River uh, where uh, uh, Indigenous peoples have met um, and traveled for millennia and always a reminder about the importance of our relationship and, and really working hard in partnership. And that is not always easy, but it is the only way uh, we can move forward. Uh, well, look, uh, it's been a really hard year and it, it continues to be a hard year for folks uh, here in Canada and the UK and around the world. Um, and uh, I think though it's important uh, to learn some lessons. And one of the lessons that I've retained from this is really on the vaccines. Um, if everyone remembers, uh, you know, when we were first at the start of the pandemic or even six months ago, people were talking about how long it was going to take to get vaccines. Maybe we'd never get a vaccine. But guess what? We did. And we will eventually get out of the pandemic. Uh, that may seem very hard some days, uh, but we will get out of it. Um, and the whole world needs to get out of it. So we do need to be supporting all countries to do that. But I think there's a really important lesson for climate change. Um, we need to take the same approach. We need to have a clear goal. We need to strive for 1.5, reaching uh, 1.5 degrees uh, of warming. We need to listen to science and scientists. We need everyone to work together. That is from indigenous peoples to other levels of government, to youth, uh, to environmentalists, to the private sector. And we need leadership. And that's why we need all you climate leaders. We can never stop, we can never give up. And I guess we can say something with the fourth be with you or be with all of us um, for today. Um, so very quickly, uh, I wanna give a huge shout out to the UK. Uh, I've had the chance to work very closely with the UK, uh, both as Minister of Environment and Climate Change. And in this role, 
And uh, I go back to COP21 where I had my friend, Amber Rudd. She was the Minister of Environment and Climate Change and we were involved in the uh, negotiations directly. And then uh, it was Claire Perry, another awesome woman. So there's certainly a lot of uh, awesome women working on climate in the UK uh, where we started the Powering Past Coal Alliance. We have to get everyone off coal. That is extraordinarily important. And we also need to make sure that there's a transition for all the workers in the communities. Um, that's a very important uh, initiative um, and Canada is, remains absolutely committed to it. Um, we're now working on the EV uh, initiative together. Obviously, we know the solutions, many of the solutions, including electric vehicles, and it's incredibly important that we raise each other's ambition and we work together. Um, look, for COP26, uh, we need to succeed. We need the UK to succeed. Uh, we need the world to succeed. And what does that mean? We need way more ambition. Let's just be frank. That is so important. Um, it's been great to see increased ambition. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, announced uh, our new target, uh, which is a, a very ambitious target, um, reaching, uh, uh, tracking to reduce emissions between 40 to 45 percent by 2005 levels by 2030. Um, that's going to require everyone coming together, every province, every municipality, uh, all of our climate leaders, uh, the private sector to uh, achieve that. Um, climate finance, uh, we heard from the High Commissioner, that's incredibly important. Um, I will say that's something that I am absolutely committed to, and I've certainly been raising that importance within our own government, but also uh, internationally, that's key. That came up in COP21 that we need to be supporting the countries that have done absolutely the least to cause the impacts of climate change that are suffering the most and will be literally underwater. Uh, if we uh, don't stay uh, well below two degrees, uh, striving for 1.5. And that does mean investing in adaptation. That I have heard that loud and clear, incredibly important. Uh, also the private sector has a huge role to play. Uh, I'm so pleased that Mark Carney is back. Uh, we called that loan back, but he's been working hard with the UK uh, to make sure that we move the billions to trillions of dollars that we need invested. Uh, in the clean economy of the future. Um, and uh, a little piece, uh, I hope everyone, I hope we get the rule book, including the market text. I did work hard on that. Um, and that's uh, a critical part of this as well. Uh, we uh, at home have been doing our work. I've always said there's, you can't go and uh, say that everyone needs to raise ambition abroad if you're not doing your hard work here. We announced our new climate plan uh, in December. I was with uh, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Environment uh, and Climate Change, as well as with Stephen Givo, a well-known environmentalist to many of you. Um, and uh, that plan had a whole range of measures. We followed that up uh, with our investment, uh, historic investment in public transit. Uh, we're already investing over $25 billion, $15 billion in new money, uh, including our first ever active transportation stream, uh, a first ever electric bus uh, stream, our first ever rural transit stream, um, as well as investing in major projects and $3 billion ongoing money for permanent public transit. It, permanent public transit is important to our future, but it's also uh, more than that. And the high commissioner talked about inclusivity. The people that are most likely uh, to be impacted by climate change, as I said, are the ones who have done the least. And we need to make sure everyone can be part of the solution. Many people that are taking public transit don't have other options. There are essential workers. They're young people, they're racialized Canadians, and we need to be making those investments, yes, for uh, the climate change, yes, for clean air, yes, so people can get around more quickly, but also because inclusivity matters. Um, we've invested uh, in retrofit, supporting individuals retrofitting their homes, businesses. Uh, we have the Canada Infrastructure Bank that is helping uh, on the retrofit piece. Uh, we're investing in transmission lines. We're 90%, uh, we're 80% uh, clean electricity. Uh, we need to get to 90% and I think we need to get to 100%. Uh, I could go on about all the things that we're doing, but now I just want to talk about everyone else, um, that we really are in this together. And uh, that's why I'm so thrilled to see so, so much diversity uh, in the climate champions. Um, I've learned that you need unusual suspects, that you need everyone to be striving towards the goal. We now have a clear goal, not only for 2030, but to be net zero by 2050. And that's going to require all hands on deck. And that's going to require leaders. 
it's not always fun stepping up. I'll tell you, uh, some days I don't love the, you know, some of the attacks I get, but we just have to be focused on the goal. The goal is tackling climate change. And there's so many amazing people. I, I want to say something about everyone. I know I'm only allowed to say the names of the eight people, but a I, I shout out to a few people. Um, David Suzuki. Uh, I remember, I mean, who doesn't know David Suzuki? He's been a, a climate champion before anyone was a climate champion and, and a champion for our environment and our planet and for nature and animals. And I, I, I remember seeing him on a boat in Guayanas. I actually thought he'd followed me because he was so committed to getting more investments in nature and to get the Indigenous Guardians program going. Um, and he just has been such an incredible leader. We're Natan Obed the head of ITK, who made me and I think our government reimagine uh, Inuit in our country uh, and, and Inuit Nunangat as a space, that it wasn't just about provinces and territories, that Inuit occupied their own space and we needed to understand and respect that. And uh, I think I learned that in Torgat Mountains National Park, a beautiful uh, place. Uh, Rob Niven, a uh, huge shout out to you, uh, getting the Carbon X Prize. So showing that Canada is punching above our weight and has the solutions. I could go on and on, but you're all really important. We need everyone to be a climate champion. So let's go recruit um, because we're going to tackle COVID-19. We're going to conquer it. And we also need to conquer the climate, climate crisis. Um, that's a huge economic opportunity. It's also a huge risk to us if we don't do that. And also, at the end of the day, it's about the future we want for our kids and grandkids. Um, it's up to us, so let's just do it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Minister. Thank you for those inspiring words. As you say, it's, we're, we're all in this together. Um, and I'm hoping that, that certainly with the champions, it's the beginning of a conversation that is going to grow and grow and grow and grow and continue to do that. Um, so you've already given a shout out to a few people, but if I can ask you to take us through the next eight, that would be wonderful. And we'll just get the videos up now. Sorry, sure. the slides. Yeah. Okay, enough of me. I don't know if we've got the next slide. There we go. Marsha Smith, uh, Senior Vice President, Sustainability and External Affairs at Tech Resources Limited. Ryan Buji, or I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, if I pronounce that Ryan Buggy, uh, Director of Strategic Initiatives and Sector Development with the Vancouver Economic Commission. Kim Tomasin, uh, Executive Vice President, Head of Investments in Quebec and Stewardship Investing, uh, the Caisse de Dépôt et de Placement du Québec. Nathan Obed, President of Inuit Tapirat Kanatami. Valerie Short, Short uh, Vice President, Corporate Citizenship and Sustainability, RBC. Inder Betty, founder of Matt and Nat and 457 Anu. Marina Melanidis, Melanidis uh, apologies if I pronounced that wrong, founder and co managing director, Youth for Nature. And there we go, Rob Niven, uh, chief executive officer and founder of Carbon Cure Technologies. Huge congratulations to all of you, but to, of course, to all 26 climate champions. Now go recruit. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Thank you so much for that. Um, so um, I mentioned at the beginning that unfortunately we would have loved to have heard from all 26. Unfortunately, it's just not possible time-wise, but we do have two excellent, excellent champions who are going to speak to us today, um, also giving us a few minutes on their hopes for COP26. So. Um, as Ms. McKenna alluded to, uh, David Suzuki needs no introduction, but as many of you know, Dr. Suzuki is a Canadian scientist, television personality, author, and environmental activist. And uh, Dr. Suzuki, if you could tell us about uh, your vision and hopes for COP26, please. Thank you. I'm speaking from the traditional unceded territory of the Weeweke Nation on Quadra Island, who cared for these lands and waters for thousands of years, a genuine example of sustainability. On behalf of all of the climate champions, I say thank you for this recognition. Although champions are usually winners, aren't they? And we're not there yet. But I am delighted that we are a part of a growing movement in search of a way to live in balance 
with the life support systems of the planet. As a biologist, I think of human evolution, which began in Africa 150,000 years ago, an ordinary two-legged furless ape with very little to indicate our explosive future. Our great advantage was an immense brain that was curious, observant, inventive, learned by trial and error, and remembered. That brain invented a concept called the future. No other animal has a sense of the future as we do. And we realized we could affect that future by what we do in the present. It began simply enough, for example, walking along a path that comes to a fork and remember, remembering while well, I went down to the right and I ran into a saber-toothed tiger. But when I went off to the left, I found something good to eat. So I'm going left. Foresight was a huge advantage by looking ahead, seeing where obstacles, hazards, and opportunities lay, and deliberately choosing to avoid danger and exploit opportunity. The trapping of heat on Earth's surface by greenhouse gases has been known since the early 1800s. And by the 1950s, climatologists were warning of the danger from excess production of greenhouse gases. U.S. President Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s spoke of the threat of global warming, while President Jimmy Carter in the late 60s turned down the White House thermostat, wore sweaters, and installed solar panels. For more than half a century, scientists armed with supercomputers have been warning with increasing alarm and urgency that we face catastrophic consequences of our exploding numbers, technology, hyperconsumption, and a globalized economy, not only from climate change, but also mass species extinction, ocean degradation, and toxic pollution of the biosphere. Why are we turning our backs on the strategy that got us here? Look ahead recognize the threats and opportunities, and act to avoid danger. Over the past millennium, we have moved from an understanding that we are part of a web of relationships with all other species of animals and plants, and with air, water, soil, and sunlight. We've moved from that to a belief that our great intelligence enables us to escape the laws of nature that govern our existence and well-being. In the past two centuries, we've moved from agrarian villages to big cities, where globalization and the economy have created an illusion of continued progress defined by growth in money and consumption. We no longer understand that we are part of and utterly dependent on nature for our health and well being. Instead, we think human inventiveness and productivity underlie our success. So there are no limits. After all, we can fly, we can live underwater, pierce Earth's crust, peer to the edge of the universe, travel faster than the speed of sound, and escape gravity. But in celebrating our great intellect, we ignore the enormity of our ignorance and deny responsibility to use our powers more carefully and wisely. Our anthropocentrism, the belief that we are the center of the action, blinds us to the fact that the systems of religion, law, economics, and politics that shape and guide our priorities are rigged. They put people and our constructs, borders, money, markets, corporations, governments, above the very things that keep us alive and healthy. There remain people who continue to see our embeddedness in a web of relationships and hold a responsibility to protect that web. This is an ecocentric perspective. And of course, it is embedded in the worldviews of indigenous people around the world to whom we must look for help to find a new relationship with nature based on gratitude, humility, and responsibility. After 25 COP meetings, can we really feel hopeful that the 26th will be any different? 
global emissions have continued to rise through the entire COP process. And despite promises of all kinds, Canada has not met a single target we signed on to. Toronto in 1988, Rio in 1992, Kyoto in 1997, Paris in 2015, the 2019 post-Madrid target that Canada brags of, net zero carbon by 2050, is no commitment when there will be a minimum of six elections before then, and not one current MP will still be in office. So where and who is accountable? The transformation has begun because climate change is palpable, but incremental change will no longer do it. We need transformational change. We must adopt an all out war strategy like we did in World War II, or the Americans did after the, uh, the, the sending of Sputnik into the uh, atmosphere. But I fear our anthropocentrism will continue to stall the big actions needed by every nation. Thank you so much, Dr. Suzuki. I mean, those are indeed um, powerful words and very much food for thought. And as you say, COP26 is definitely an inflection point and um, it is a, a, an ongoing issue and pressure for us all that we all have to work together on. Um, I am now delighted to move on to our next uh, champion. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to uh, introduce you to Melina Labukan Massimo, who is Lubicon Cree from Northern Alberta. <clears throat> Melina has worked on the social, environmental and climate justice issues for the past 20 years and is the Just Transition Director at Indigenous Climate Action and the founder of Sacred Earth Solar. She's also the host of a new TV series called Power to the People, which profiles uh, renewable energy, food security, and eco-housing projects in indigenous communities across Canada. And uh, I've seen one or two episodes, and I can highly, highly commend it to you. It's an excellent series. Uh, so, Melina, if I could hand over to you for your thoughts, please. Thank you, Nicole. Tansegwakia, nia Melina mi wapen la boka masmo nia nihao kines kumtanawa. Thank you for having me today. I would like to thank the Canadian Law Institute for this award and extend my gratitude to all of those who are working hard to address the climate crisis, including my cl fellow climate champions. My vision of a net zero world is one where Canada respects and upholds the sovereignty and knowledge of Indigenous peoples. Implementing a just transition and committing to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples are essential to a net zero pathway. Prioritizing Indigenous peoples in communities who bear the brunt of environmental contamination in their homelands is critical. A net zero future means that we no longer have sacrifice zones or sacrificed communities. It is with these justice tenants in mind that I accept this nomination. I myself come from a community that is a sacrifice community. We have felt the brunt of environmental contamination since I was born. The toxic burden that we bear is a lived reality in communities and Indigenous communities alike. It is a burden we shoulder for the rest of Canadian society and, a globe, and our global addiction to oil. The compromised water and air we drink, air, um, water we drink and air we breathe reminds me every day that our current system is unsustainable and an unacceptable cost to communities. I need to mention that before colonization occurred here on this continent, indigenous peoples were thriving in a healthy and balanced ecosystem. It is no coincidence that it was the case that this land was in pristine condition teeming with abundance because indigenous peoples knew how to live in a reciprocal relationship with the land. Indigenous peoples cultural practices fostered a deep sense of re responsibility to take care of the land and to live in reciprocity with the land, which allowed both of us both to thrive. For us to truly solve this climate crisis, we need a global paradigm shift back to understanding and living within the natural laws of our earth. We must relearn how to live in reciprocity with the land. It comes as no surprise as indicated by our current climate crisis that humans do not actually have dominion over the earth, nor should they. Our relationship with the natural world, world cannot be transactional. It cannot be a transactional one because we have seen time and time again this fail as a shift to an indigenous framework. A shift to an indigenous framework of relationship with the earth is at the heart of a solution oriented climate action. This needs to be a, wide a widespread understanding of indigenous, what indigenous peoples have always known. What we do to the land, we do to ourselves. 
Humanity has lost this sacred connection to the earth. And this is why we are now living in an era of consequence. Indigenous peoples safeguard 80% of the bio world's biodiversity. It is critical that we in turn safeguard the people who protect the lands and waters that give us all life. Yet today here in Canada and around the world, indigenous land defenders are being criminalized for standing up protect, to protect their homelands. A just transition places indigenous communities at the forefront of an energy transition to ensure that our future energy system does not reproduce the imbalances or inequities of the current one. Indigenous peoples are already leading the way towards this transition, which is amazing because I've been from coast to coast to coast in indigenous communities throughout my time as a climate campaigner and while filming the TV show, Power to the People, which profiles renewable energy, eco-housing and food security in indigenous communities across this country. What I heard was a resounding yes to the ur urgent climate action in indigenous communities. This is why I decided to build a solar project in my own home community, which is in the heart of the tar sands with a 20.8 kilowatt system which actually empowers our health center and why I founded Sacred Earth Solar and why I helped co-found Indigenous Climate Action. It was actually the first time I saw in my community the ability to dream and vision together about the future that we wanted to see, one where we were the decision makers of how we would produce energy. There are already over 2,500 Indigenous-led renewable energy projects and stories like ours across this country with over 200 of those being large scale revenue generating projects. The revenues generated create a multitude of benefits and flow back to the communities as opposed to flowing out of the, out of the community. This actually creates energy democracy where communities are decision makers and a part of the solution. So we need to see investment in renewable energy projects, more robust progressive renewable energy policies and foster support for community ownership models that support this transition. The transition itself must be equitable as it redresses past harms and creates a new relationship of power for the future through reparations and true reconciliation, not solely lip service to, to these ideals, but actual legislation and policies that commit to giving land back to ind indigenous communities so that they can be stewards of their homelands once again. This is the future that we wanna see and these are achievable climate solutions. A first few steps as I end um, towards reducing our GHG emissions to truly achieve net zero include respecting the rights and decisions of Indigenous peoples to say no to extraction in their homelands, implementing UNDRIP and free power and informed consent as a legislative require requirement, ending fossil fuel subsidies to the industries that are responsible for fueling the climate crisis, cancelling the Trans Mountain Pipeline, ensure we, ensure we are investing ensure that we are not investing in false solutions of unproven techno fixes perpetuating the, the idea that we can burn now and pay later which also means that we need to halt the expansion of the tar sands and of course invest in renewable energy programs and policies that usher in an energy democracy that we need to see there is no climate justice without indigenous sovereignty we can build a, a brighter future for generations to come but we must as human beings relearn how to live in reciprocity and in sacred relationship with mother earth once again. Hi, hi, thank you. Thank you so much, Melina. That, that was um, really insightful and uh, very moving as well. I'm, I'm, I'm struck with um, the era of consequence. I think that is such, a, such an important phrase to remember and uh, you know, one that is, is never true of, of how we're um, approaching this question now and we're, the consequences that we're making for ourselves. Um, so this brings us kind of to the last segment now, and um, I would now like to hand back to the High Commissioner to introduce our final eight climate champions. We will then have a short period of time for Q&A, so just a reminder to pop any, um, any questions you have in the chat and we'll hopefully get to them. Um, but High Commissioner, over to you for our um, uh, final, but definitely uh, right up there, group of eight. Thank you, Nicole. So the last eight are Eric Saint-Pierre, the executive director of the Trottier Family Foundation. Linda Cody, who's the executive director of the Pembina Institute. Darcy Wood, the CEO at Aki Energy. <coughs> Anna K. Russell, the director of strategy and government at Leading Change Canada. David Arsenault, CEO and the co-founder of Efenco. <coughs> Sophie, 
Susan Migichi, the Global Director, Strategy and Policy at Climate Change and sorry, Global Director of Strategy and Policy, Climate Change and Set Sustainability. That sounds like four jobs at Hatch. Scott Skinner, the President and CEO of the Clean Foundation. Jennifer McNeil, the Vice President, Sales and Marketing for the Public Sector at the NFI Group. Fantastic. Thank you so much, High Commissioner. And uh, as I said, you, people will be receiving a copy of the storybook uh, so you can see the, the bios in detail. Um, and you can also follow the various groups on Twitter. We've tweeted out details at UK and Canada and at Can Climate Law as well. So you can have a look there. And um, but as I say, I really hope this that many of these people are people that are already well connected to. But I really hope that this is the beginning of a conversation of how we can work together towards COP26 and beyond. Um, so we do have time for some questions, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm going to kick off if I can, um, High Commissioner. Um, so we mentioned that today marks six months to COP26, although the countdown has obviously started much earlier than this and goes beyond COP26. But can you say a little bit more about why it's so important to work together bilaterally um, between UK and Canada? And can you say a little bit about how we're engaging across the country in the run up to COP26? Yeah, so um, I don't think uh, any country is going to be successful if it works on its own. Uh, and the UK and Canada as, as real um, uh, key members of uh, many of the uh, international institutions which are key in addressing climate change, um, uh, are more, uh, will have more impact and more effect if we work together. Um, but not just uh, in putting across our own messages. I think it's really important, and, and I saw there was a question about this, that we work together in developing countries and, and to encourage others and to share our the benefit of what we've done, our expertise, uh, um, learning from, from, from how we've tackled some of these questions and, and be generous in sharing our expertise and our technology with developing countries. Um, and how we engage across the country, well, it's, it's bizarre, actually, that uh, COVID has made that in some ways easier for us, in that we have hosted a huge number of events like this, um, and, and it's allowed us to reach parts of the country which otherwise we would have had great difficulty either physically getting to, or had the time to, to, to travel uh, um, as extensively as we've been able to virtually. So um, I think one of the challenges always, if you're in my job, is that um, you inherit lists of people that you engage with and they tend to be people that your predecessor or your pre predecessor's predecessor engaged with. But one of the great things about, um, about uh, COP26 is that it's allowed us to uh, reach out beyond the usual suspects and engage with a lot of a lot more young people than we would normally do um, with uh, the indigenous communities in ways which are really powerful and impactful and I, and I thought Melina's speech was really hard hitting but also very moving um, and to hear at first hand from those communities has really informed uh, our response and some of the policy responses that we're making. Um, and we have a network across the country, but um, we've got, been able to go much further than that and much more broadly. So, um, you know, young people, uh, academic institutions, the media, uh, and provincial governments, as well as the federal government, business, um, we are trying uh, not to neglect any part of Canadian society in the way that we engage and the way that we work together with the Canadian government to raise awareness and take action. Great, thank you so much. Um, I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the bilateral engagement is so key, and 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 as I, as you said, hearing from Melina about the impact on Indigenous communities is, is really sort of uh, something that we're take really taking into consideration as we take forward our discussions. Um, Minister, if I can turn to you, it's been encouraging to see Canada's increased ambition uh, recently announced at the Earth Day Summit and in the federal budget. Can you talk a little bit about um, the federal government's efforts to work with, with municipal and provincial governments to move our aspirations towards net zeros and how these various plans feed into each other to, to move up to federal level? Um, that's great. I just saw the question there. So that's uh, it's a really important question because uh, it, it depends on how you where you are, um, but it's estimated about 40 percent of emissions are in direct control of municipalities and they're incredibly important part of the solution. And we've seen that in Canada. I mean, and actually, I mean, I think it's 80 percent of Canadians live in cities or in suburbs of cities. So obviously that you know we need to be working together and that's been a real focus of mine was how do we work directly with communities uh, to foster local solutions and to reward ambition 
Um, I've said to folks, everyone needs a climate plan, though. Everyone needs a target because uh, that's how you get discipline. It's not about green. I don't, I don't. I mean, I care about green, but I actually care about emission reductions and I, I care about community resilience. And so our programs, um, they vary. Uh, we have programs uh, where public transit, obviously working directly with municipalities on public transit. I mean, provinces are can be engaged in funding, but some of our new programs will be direct with municipalities on um, buildings. Um, energy efficiency, um, the largest source of emissions in, in, depending on where you are, can be from the built environment. Um, so retrofit programs, including in partnership with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. Disaster mitigation, um, we've talked about this internationally, but adaptation is a real thing. Um, and we have worked on the science um, and, you know, you see modeling and we have huge vulnerabilities there. So doing uh, disaster mitigation and adaptation projects directly with municipalities is really important. And on the indigenous piece, I think that is absolutely critical. Um, I've worked with so many different communities, whether they're First Nations, Métis, Inuit, they have solutions. Um, and in fact, they're on the land and they understand this, our relationship with the land far better than, than most of us do. Um, and uh, it's really making sure that we have solutions in partnership with them. So many of our programs our direct partnerships with Indigenous peoples. Um, we've been doing amazing things on nature. We will not uh, protect 25% of our nature without Indigenous peoples. And so these broader partnerships um, are, are really, really key. And we're going to continue doing that. Um, if you're going, you know, we, we've committed to ambitious target and that requires everyone. It's not just the federal government. People sometimes think if only the federal government had a magic wand. Uh, we need to be working with provinces, we need to be working with Indigenous peoples, we need to be working with industry um, and, uh, well, environmentalists, civil society, um, and then we need to be following the lead of the kids, because the kids are saying do more every single day, which I think is also really important, because we have to mobilize all Canadians in feeling like this is a Canadian effort. Thank you. And that actually brings me very neatly onto a question that's come up in the chat for the High Commissioner. Um, High Commissioner, will this COP26 address the critical roles of cities in advancing climate solutions? And is there going to be more focus on public engagement in the move to net zero? So I think absolutely. Um, as as uh, Mr. McKenna has just pointed out, um, quite a lot of the um, uh, of the emissions and uh, some of the uh, of the action needs to be taken at municipal level, um, and that that's uh, that's both a challenge and an opportunity. Um, and that sometimes, uh, as we have seen in the United States recently, where the uh, the national government has not necessarily been the most supportive of action against climate change, uh, individual municip municipalities have, have, have done their own thing. And I think that's a really powerful model. Um, and I think there's a lot that um, uh, big metropolises, particularly in, in developing countries, can learn from the way in which uh, large uh, uh, urban uh, centres in, in developing countries have been uh, addressing uh, climate change. And, and it, it, that, that also uh, links to the question that somebody else asked about incrementalism or whether we should do this incrementally or whether we should be uh, a bit more ambitious. I think that um, our governments have shown that... Um, or experience has shown that unless government takes uh, really challenging policy decisions, incrementalism is just not gonna do it. We have to push and force behavior change and we have to force uh, the private sector and business and individuals to behave differently because most people don't like change, whether they're business people or individual citizens, they don't like it. People are comfortable. Most people in our countries are fairly comfortable. And I think unless we as governments uh, press uh, and say, for example, from 2035, you will not be able to buy a petrol car in the, UK, in the UK if you want a new car. Those are the sorts of things which will make a huge difference. And I, and I think incrementalism is not is just not, not going to do it anymore. We need to be a lot bolder than that and a lot more courageous than that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, uh, you know, the incrementalism versus versus the, it's just it, it just is a step by step approach that just isn't uh, feasible anymore. And perhaps, Minister, I could put that in the Canadian context because as we mentioned the increased ambition for Canada, but uh, and you know, it, it is it is partly about money, but it's heart, partly about hearts, hearts and minds. How do you see that challenge moving forward in a Canadian context? And kind of what is the next part of the discussion in terms of bringing this to the uh, the people and what needs to be done on a sort of day to day level? 
Well, look, I mean, I think we have to give the Canadian public a lot of credit. Uh, we've brought in a price on pollution across the country and people have said politically, you can't do it. Uh, it wasn't easy, but we did it. I think one of the most important things is that people understand the scale of the challenge uh, and they understand that we have solutions. Um, and they don't fall like, you know, they don't fall for fatalism that we, we can't do this. Um, but they recognize that everyone has to do their part. I mean, part of it is on politicians. We have to talk like real people uh, talk. I, I try to do that because uh, maybe I'm originally from Hamilton. People in Hamilton, they talk like real people. But, um, you know, people, they don't want to just hear about cops and, and adaptation and mitigation and all these things. They don't necessarily know what we're talking about. But people care about clean air and they care about clean water and they care about their kids who are literally saying to them, like, why are you using this plastic <laughs> or, you know, why are we getting an electric vehicle or all of, you know, why are we need to march in the streets? I, I think it is very important to mobilize people. But I mean, another thing I have learned is that you have to think about people. Um, that uh, it's it's politics, it's policy and people. I try to bring that to every single decision I make that comes across my desk because we do need to think about people in communities uh, that are being impacted. And I know in the UK, uh, you know, your coal is a thing. Um, I mean, maybe, you know, you managed, you know, you're in, in a, a good space now, but we literally, when we said we were phasing out coal, we're phasing out people's jobs. Uh, and that has a real impact on communities. And you can't just, there's no magic wand. You actually have to go. We, we I think, had one of the world's first uh, just transition task force. Um, we had Hassan Youssef, uh, one of our amazing labor leaders, who went out to communities with the task force. And they sat down in communities where there were 600 people in a room, crowded room, um, and uh, they listened to them. And it was hard because people were angry and scared and uh, you know, wondering what this meant for their future. But, but they were actually, if you talk to Hassan Youssef, it's amazing because he said people actually appreciated that the government came and listened to them. And we're, you know, we're talking about, we're bringing in programs um, for the community investments in infrastructure, but also for people. So I think there's a lot to be done, but I do think uh, the high commissioner's right. Uh, you have to be bold and courageous. And this is not little things you gotta do. You gotta do the big things and those are really hard. And sometimes people don't like them. Mm -hmm. And there will be people, forces, uh, I will tell you, and I know them, <laughs> that will tell you, uh, that will fight you uh, every step of the way. Um, but I believe in Canadians and I believe that people uh, are smart uh, and you've got to give them credit, but you got to talk to them and you've got to explain to them what you're doing. And then you got to show leadership and you have to mobilize. But you know who's been the most effective? I've got to give it to the kids. Uh, Greta um, and all the young people in Canada that I have seen um, out there marching in the streets. Um, I remember my dad, he said like, how can a grandfather now not stand for climate action? Like, I, he's like, I don't understand it. Like I talked to my grandkids, like how could you be against a price on pollution or how could you be against and it? And I think that's really important to giving space for young people to show the leadership that they have for indigenous people, for racialized communities that we don't always hear their voices. Uh, but we need to also, we need to make sure that we're amplifying them and then we are listening to them. Fantastic, thank you. And actually that, that uh, is, is a great way to take us out, particularly your phrase, be bold, be courageous and let's do the big things. So um, we are out of time, but thank you so much um, for taking part today. Thank you, Ms. McKenna, High Commissioner Lejeune Dalgazek. Thank you, Melina. Thank you, David. Um, it's been fantastic um, and um, it gives us a lot of food for thought. And as I say, there will be follow up. Do take the time to read the quotes of the champions because they make collectively a very, very powerful story. Um, so that brings us to the end. If everybody has time to stay online for just a few minutes, we recently ran a, a photography competition at UK and Canada. And in fact, the minister and the high commissioner were both judges. Uh, we had some amazing, amazing entries and we're just going to show you the winning photographs at the end which show climate change as it is now so uh, do stay online take a look and um, thank you so much for joining and have a good day thank you very much thank you, thank you.